Yeah, I, uh, I got a little nervous when the sun came through the cathedral, and I'm a corporate guy after what I just heard about Monsanto. I kind of hoping that something doesn't happen here on the stage. Um, now, I'm also here to talk about a really, really, really tough invasive species that we haven't talked about yet, and that is wasteful human beings occupying buildings. So, with that slow start, I'd like to say that, you know, the smart buildings movement is, is at the dawn of its beginning. It's totally fractured and, 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 and incredibly dynamic with many ideas out there on how we get there. And for, for, the, for this 15-minute short little high-level talk about buildings, I want you to think about the smart buildings as a destination. A smart building uh, designation may in the future be something akin to a LEED certified building or a standard. Uh, it is, though, however, up in the air on how we get there and what it really looks like when we get there. And I, I would venture to say that smart building the term will go the way green and hopefully not sustainability. I like that word the best because I think we, we, we are all part of a, as this, as this uh, uh, forum suggests, a part of a very, very big human sustainability movement. I really appreciated the, the uh, opportunity to uh, person like me with my IQ and my background following all these scientists. That's a terrible setup. I owe you one. Um, so let's, I'm going to talk about where we've been, kind of where we are, and then, then the future of getting to a smart building, what that really means. So, you know, in the 1950s, it was an era of total abundance, uh, ex inexpensive resources. I mean, power was 1.8 cents a kilowatt hour in major cities, which is basically free. So no one's going to behave to be efficient when the power is free. They have other things in their business model. It was, it was the era of the air conditioner. My father was in the piping business in, McKins in the 50s. He and Mac McKinstry, my, my godfather, and he started McKinstry, our company, in the 1960s, a plumbing company. They were the first piping company in the country that said, you know what, forced air, duct ducted forced air, air conditioning is going to happen. And it really did. Uh, the 70s was sort of the era of energy awareness. We had the energy crisis. You know, they built buildings. I mean, you know, this little, little itty-bitty windows in their back, right? The, the shading coefficients on curtain walls are now being challenged. The, the use of natural light. In the 70s, that's what it looked like. And, and it, unfortunately, the kilowatt hours were only up to about three and a half to four cents a kilowatt hour. In the 70s, or the 90s, I mean, this is where things transformed forever, and it's going to, it's, it's, it's kind of tied into technology, computers, the use of computers, uh, eventually the cloud, but the watts per square foot consumed in a building, I don't know, tripled or quadrupled instantly when you put computers on the desk at everyone's office. Uh, so it, it was only into the six and a half cents a kilowatt hour then. You know, you're still in a, a, a cost of energy that doesn't incent people to use less of it. So keep that thought as we move to where we're going. In 2010, you know, we are really in now, we're in the era of, of sustainability and all the issues surrounding sustainability, the jury's out on all these practices, green practices, we were talking up there about people trying to do their best they can do in their sphere, in their building to do a green practice. I, I keynoted Oregon Business Magazine's acknowledgement of companies that were exemplary in green practices. And you know what? I told them when I came out, I said, you know, I, don't get, I, get, I talk to the environmental communities, the business communities, the energy communities, the real estate communities. This was, these were people. These were insurance companies and restaurants and, and uh, messenger services, all doing really, really leadership-oriented, small things, purposeful in spreading the word. And I think that's the era we're into now. So what, what pathway do we need to get on? What, where, where, what do we need to do now? I want you to think of this. After I tell you this, with the exception of Brendan from RMI, who's in the audience, I'm up on the board of trustees of Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, 82 billion square feet of non-residential buildings in this country. It consumes 70%, if not more, of all the electricity. It is responsible for up to 40% of the carbon and total energy. And the scary, frightening, but opportunistic number in that equation is 50. 
it is conservatively thought, and we've confirmed it with Johnson Controls and Siemens and Chevron and McKinsey and Amresk, all these companies that work in the energy business, we are finding there are, it's conservative to say 50% of all that is wasted on the table to, to get back. Brendan's going to talk this afternoon a little bit about how that, how, where the economics of that are and where the opportunities are. But I will tell you this much. If you really did a bad job of making your buildings more efficient, changing the demand, changing our behavior, if you only got half of, the, of the what's on the table, it would represent cutting 18% of the United States demand for electricity. Workers that are already trained, they're on the sideline. It's work we already do. It's engineering we already know how to do. We just have to figure out how to move that forward. And for the young people in the audience that are really into renewable energy and quantifying which renewables are the best, and gee, is wind when you get storage and solar with the sun's not out, and, and the tides are really cool, and algae's really cool, and there's all these great ideas. There is, without a, without a question, the conservation of energy savings is the largest pool of renewable energy, cheapest to get on the planet today. So as you think about your role, because everyone goes to a building to work, we are building occupation is where we can save this country a lot of emissions and stuff like that. And the LEED certification came in the 90s, and, the, and, and that was a, tr a tremendous and seminal movement because it started, the, it started the needle moving, started the needle moving that people said, well, we're going to start acknowledging and recognizing and benchmarking buildings that are being built on their potential for being sustainable. Well, the problem that happened, it became pretty prescriptive, and LEED certification was more about what went into building the building. What was the carbon footprint? What was recycling rates? How far did the equipment have to come on a truck? Was it bought locally? There's all kinds of things. And when they, when they got done doing 10, 15 years of LEED, we found that 70% you know, of LEED certified buildings have no idea how they're operating or how they're doing or how much energy they're consuming. And to their record, to their credit, probably about now 30% they do know. There is the gateway to the smart building. How do we get buildings, when they're done, when they're remodeled, when you get, turn it over to the owner, how do we get to the point where, as a community, we know how to run the buildings? We have real-time data to know what, what parts of the buildings are consuming BTUs and therms and things like that. There's, there's this big change coming, and in the next 10 years, I think we probably should start calling them echo standards. I mean, they're... There are probably going to be codes, energy codes. ASHRAE has all kinds of really tough energy codes. The city of Seattle is moving towards public benchmarking, so all, pub all buildings would have to report out how much energy they're consuming, how much fuel they're using, the watts per square foot. So then those of us in the community can go, wow, I'm not going to rent from your building. You're consuming two times the watts per square foot of this person that's offering me space. Then you, get, then you get the community knowledgeable, and then you can go and pick where you want to lease from, and it forces the real estate industry to change their business model. And that's, that's not revolutionary. That's just human nature. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So things like cafe standards. Now, everyone knows what cafe standards are. And in fact, the auto industry gets a lot of um, negative press, but actually, the cafe standards on, e on emissions and then the CAFE standards they put in place for uh, efficiency has moved the needles on transportation. You know why? Because cars have a seven to 10 year life. You actually can take the 180 million cars and every year there's 20 million people that get rid of their old one and get a new one. The CAFE standards, the new one has new standards. In, in, in a 10 or 15 year period, you can move the needle and you can have less emissions. So we did that with cars. And now what we're doing with cars is saying we want tighter standards on how much they weigh, which Rocky Mountain Institute's doing ma massive work on, and their fuel economy, and forcing car manufacturers to give us a choice. So if you want a hybrid or an electric car, you can do that. If you want natural gas and propane for your fleet, you can do that. Uh, so it, it's kind of com combining all the things we've done in other a areas like cars into buildings. The problem with buildings is they have a 50 to 100 year life. So building a new building and ha having a standard on it is fine, but there's no immediate help to, to what we're doing now for many, many years. So that's why we're, we, we design and build new buildings, but we also have a huge practice in our 
company to retrofit and energy, energy retrofit and manage and facility manage existing buildings. And I, I was just uh, talking to John up there is I made the mistake of saying something against net zero buildings at a, at a conference I was at in San Francisco. And I didn't mean to disparage it. I just, someone asked me, what do you think about net zero building new buildings? I said, well, do I think it's a good idea for the Bullet Foundation to do what they're doing? Yeah, or Brook Sports, which we're doing over in, in Fremont with Skanska. Yes, it is absolutely imperative we start doing that. But it's only sustainable if there wasn't a building next to it they could have renovated and moved into. Now, I, I, they took that as a really mean statement, and I got chewed out at the end and all that stuff. So, um, <laughs> echo districts, information, actionable information, knowing what we're doing. So disruptions arrived. So my, my, my son did this, uh, this slide. And it's a juxtaposition, obviously, about getting things in the right order. You know, we, we've, we we're a 52-year-old company, and we've obviously for 50, have, have been in buildings, designing buildings, sending service techs out, and we have the data, how much it costs and how much manpower costs. We have construction crews. We take care of buildings. So now, you, but, but the problem with getting things in the right order is that you get the government incentivizing in the wrong order. The right order is get the buildings we have efficient. Get in there, clean them up. Don't spend a ton of money, but at least get them working to the way they were installed. Clean up the boilers, fix the controls. If you have, if you have doors that are leaking, fix stuff. So you get a baseline on what you have. And maybe you do some retrofits. Then you move to smart where you, where you alarm you get an interface so you can watch inlet temperatures, boilers on and off, doors open, fan speeds. So then you sort of know how the building's operating. Then you bring on the, this notion of renewable energy. Do you want to go to an echo district? Do you want to do a geo, geothermal? Do you want to put uh, small-scale solar wind on your... We get mixed up in, in, the, in, the, in the, this notion that we see George Jetson flying in a... In a in an environmentally safe hydrogen flying car and all the wind farms all over and everyone's clean. And you're not, you just can't get there until you approach the problem in existing buildings in the right order. So, how do, how do I think we're going to get there? And I'm going to close with these three or four slides. You, you have to engineer a building smart to get it functioning at the end smart. Right now we have a very, very siloed A architect, E engineering, C, construction, O, turnover operation. There's companies in all those spaces who all have their own little segments they want to put in a building, and they all have chips in it. They all electronically talk to the mainframe, they say, and you end up with buildings. If you just take all those and put it in, you end up with buildings that are a total disaster because it's not conceptualized at the beginning to understand how you operate real time to make good business decisions because most buildings in this country are not, are not online. We're managing 500 million square feet of buildings across the country from a, a, a remote monitoring control room in, at McKinstry. We can dispatch people. A, 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 a boiler can break down in Bethesda, Maryland. The computer tells our computer, because of the parameters they said, it's off. A, a technician can go, wow, the boiler's off. They can try to restart it computer to computer. Saving the, the carbon of sending a truck, and Barney goes, he's the wrong guy, what are you doing there? So you, you can fix things computer to computer, tech to computer, tech on the other side to computer tech, or you can dispatch someone. If you can, if we're doing a school district, we manage a school district. We manage our maintenance people. And I'll give you an example. After one year of us doing that, we cut their dis, we had dispatch avoidance of 65%. In other words, we reduced a, a person being called out to an issue in a school, a cold gym or a, a leak, or 65% by having the smart computers talk to each other and say, well, it's, it's a boiler, but it's really not the boiler, it's the controls. Well, it's the electrical. So you didn't send a boiler guy that goes, hey, Barney, I'm, not a, I'm a boiler guy. It's not boilers. So and you send in a, a control guy. Well, you know, hey, it's not a you, you get the point. And, and men, cost, you know, the, the, the burden cost of a person in a truck is 100, 100 bucks an hour before billing rates. So that's a really important thing to, to learn. So engineer is smart. That's what I just talked about. And, and to unsilo, we all go to the second, to unsilo that, you need to change how we, how we do construction. 
right now, most of the work in the United States is done on a low bid, right? It's not sustainable to have one industry design something, hand it over to another industry, the general contractors, who then take sub bids on all the infrastructure, and everyone's a low bidder, and then you get done, and then you turn it over to someone to run the building. There's no one in that chain that's responsible for how it runs. Would, who would ever buy a car without knowing its fuel efficiency? How, how would Boeing sell Alaska Airlines a plane if the Boeing couldn't tell them everything was going to happen for 20 years after you buy that plane? How many people in it? How many cycles could do? How many, how many takeoffs? How many landings? How, how much will it cost? What's your fuel burden? What's the weight? So you have a really dysfunctional American, everyone has the right to be a low bidder. So that's, that's, a, that's a big subject. We've got to move it into a negotiated we do most negotiated, and we have many friends in the general contracting business that are great people that are in the other way. And finally, I'll say, is to operate a building with this data. It's a lot about education, uh, knowing what you're turning over. And the green jobs in that space are really are going to be huge because Barney the engineer of the old days in the old buildings, when they weren't sophisticated and energy was cheap, it didn't matter. Times are changed. We're gonna, there's probably going to be 100,000, 200,000 people in the facility management business on the green sustainability premise in the next five years. We have 200 of them. And my closing slide is this. Think of it this way. Is there, what's this, there, there's no such thing as a sustainable design. I mean, I'm embellishing. Obviously, an architect can design a building that he thinks would be, or she would be. But there really isn't such thing as a design in and of itself being sustainable. And there's not anything such thing as a sustainable building. There's only one thing that's true. You, there is such thing as a sustainably operated building, and that's the destination of smart buildings. Thank you. Thank you.